Hello, my dog lovers. Hi. I'm here today with Alicia. Hi, Alicia. Hello, and uh, happy Thursday. <laughs> Alicia and I, we got together uh, a few minutes before we started. And she said, I'm so excited that you're running this because uh, we get so many questions. And I'm actually really excited running this too, even though um, this time, out of my regular rule, I took um, maybe two or three days preparing for this presentation because it's so important. And so many of you have been uh, asking about how to keep your dog safe, safe and how to, how to protect them from uh, side effects of vaccines. And whenever I take a little bit more time with anything, I dive really into detail and I got a little drowned in the detail, but then I thought, okay, I have to give you the basics, the essentials, and, and also the, the important steps of how to keep your dog healthy, how to keep your dog safe from disease, but also vaccines. So let's get going. And the first question that I'd like to ask you is, do you vaccinate your dog or not? And why? If you do, uh, I know that you're doing it out of the best intentions. And I do not think, I do not think it's wrong. If you don't, I also know that you're doing this um, out of your best convictions. And um, I don't think that you're doing something wrong either. But, you know, uh, there's one, one, one way to look at vaccination. Um, I prepared an egg today for the presentation. I have an egg here. <laughs> now, if you think that um, the secret to vaccination isn't an egg, you may be right. If you don't know how an egg connects with vaccination, I'll explain. Now, imagine that this egg is live and a mother hen just laid it. And she knows intuitively that the egg has to be not too warm because it would cook and not too cold because it, was die, it would die too. And with vaccines, it's actually something similar. If we over vaccinate, if we give too many vaccines, we can actually cause problems. And if we don't vaccinate enough at the right times, we may cause problems too. And you may be surprised that I am actually talking about possible vaccination because some of you may see me as a, as a person who doesn't like vaccine. I'm actually not, not that person. I like reasonable, sensible approach to medicine whether it's treating disease or dealing with vaccines. And the most important part in deciding what is actually important is your dog and his or her safety. Nothing else matters. So, um, you know, there is so much that I wanted to talk to you about. And when I started creating this presentation, I, I decided to use almost exclusively my pictures. And the reason for that is that sometimes presentations can be dull and boring. And I have 130,000 <laughs> images in my portfolio. And I thought I may as well just share them and see whether I can connect vaccines with light. Obviously vaccines are given to protect uh, the body against disease, to ensure that the body knows how to deal with challenges the same way Surfers deal with waves and challenges. The immune system has to learn how to surf the wave of disease. The immune system of your puppy doesn't just come and say, okay, I can, I can bring it on, I can handle it all, right? The body needs to learn how to deal with immunity. The body needs to learn how to train, how to be supported. And at the beginning, the support comes from the mother, from the maternal immunity, because the mother is actually the antibody given, give a giver, or or yeah, yeah, giver. <laughs> um, most mothers, uh, whether it's um, human mothers or canine mothers, have certain levels of antibodies, and they're able to protect them, uh, pass them on to uh, to the puppies or to babies. Um, the antibodies, I'm going to explain again, antibodies are uh, 
are substances that float in the bloodstream that are generated by the immune system, including white blood cells and some other um, parts of the immune system like thymus and, and spleen. Um, the antibodies are generated to neutralize the antigen, which is the virus. So imagine that the egg now is not an egg anymore, but it's a virus or a bacteria. And the body generates antibodies, antibodies when either it gets uh, in touch with the virus or bacteria and then it memorizes it and it remembers it in the little catalog to make sure that, uh, that it can produce the antibodies later on. Or the antibodies are given from, uh, by the mother. And when the antibodies get in touch with the bacteria or virus, um, they neutralize the bacteria and virus. They also trigger a whole reaction of blood, white blood cells that basically ingest and digest and destroy the pathogen. So that's super important to remember because um, if you remember that the, the antibodies are to neutralize the antigen or the pathogen, that will be helpful for you to understand the vaccines a little more and what happens with vaccines. So antibodies and antigen. Now, I obviously there is not much relationship with surfing and antibodies and antigen, but I do see immunity as a, as a strength that gradually develops in the body. And we must make sure that we don't really bring the surfer, the puppy in too high waves and that we don't really challenge it too much one way with too many pathogens in another way with too many vaccines. So, you know, the maternal immunity gets passed on through colostrum, which is the thick milk um, at the beginning of lactation. Usually they say that it uh, is produced for the first 24 hours plus minus. Every dog, every being, every mammal is a little different. Um, some antibodies get, get passed through placenta, but in dogs and cats, that does not happen as readily. See the antibodies as um, skip the dishes system, right? Like we all like to call, call up Uber Eats or skip the dishes and ask them to deliver food when we don't wanna do anything and just eat. When the mother passes on the antibodies, that's exactly what goes on. The puppy doesn't really do anything. The puppy doesn't cook, in quotes, the antibodies. It doesn't make the antibodies. It just uses them because they are accepted through the colostrum. So that's kind of a neat thing that nature uh, allowed puppies to grow and mature and the immune system mature until it's capable of producing its own antibodies. Now, there is another form of preparing a meal or cooking, in quotes, cooking antibodies. That is homemade meal. We all love homemade meals, and especially now we are kind of masters in making homemade meals after COVID broke out. The interesting part is that the maternal antibodies, the antibodies that come from the mother actually block the immune response. Um, when I was doing some research and reading in preparation, I only confirmed what I already knew that uh, in either mammal or humans or canines, the maternal antibodies actually block the response to the vaccine. But it is also my knowledge, and I didn't find the reference uh, in this particular article, but it is also my knowledge that the antibodies or the, the the maternal antibodies get neutralized by the vaccine. It's almost like they, you know, they, if, if I pass over, if I'm the mother <laughs> and I pass over the antibodies against distemper and then I give vaccine against distemper, the antibodies will be actually latched onto the virus or onto the vaccine and will be kind of neutralized as well, will be used up. See it as a storage of antibodies. And if I give the vaccine, the antibodies will be used up. So ironically, if there are maternal antibodies and if the body cannot make their own, the vaccine is actually contra counterproductive, it may decrease the maternal antibodies. And we also know that the maternal antibodies block the response to the uh, vaccine. So this is super important for you to remember because now you may be thinking, well, you know, what we are doing in veterinary medicine may not be making much sense. And this is what I came to. Uh, because it's very clear and research has confirmed that. 
So acquired immunity. Acquired immunity happens in nature. This is actually my dog, Pax, in the back here on the left, and his sister and his mother. <laughs> actually, no, I think that that's, his, uh, that's not his mother, that's his uncle. His name was Pax too, believe it or not. Uh, crazy. I, I chose the name before and then we got to the farm and realized that uh, Pax's uncle is Pax too. <laughs> anyway, acquired immunity is acquired by exposure to the pathogens or vaccines, meaning that the body creates uh, the antibodies. In nature, it would be very simple. Puppies are protected by the maternal antibodies, and then they gradually start making their own antibodies in that period where the maternal antibodies drop enough for the body to be able to make the acquired immunity, the antibodies uh, on its own. Acquired immunity is basically an equivalent of cooking the meal. When do we vaccinate? Vaccination should be given only when antibodies are absent. And when the immune system is mature, you guys remember that, that you would not let uh, someone who is immature to cook your meal, right? Like if you have a three-year-old cooking a meal, that would be a disaster. And we are actually asking our four or eight week old puppies to cook the antibodies, to make the antibodies, and, and they are not capable of doing that. Now, the core diseases that we kind of deal with, uh, with regards to vaccination, there, you know, there's a lot of opinions about what is a core, core disease and what is not. In my mind, the diseases that I've seen in practice are distemper, pyrovirus, and then adenovirus and pyroinfluenza are part of the kennel cough complex. There's also bordetella, which is a separate bacteria that is not considered core disease, but usually, usually uh, you, get, uh, you get distemper pyrovirus vaccine with a few of these um, others, adenovirus, pyroinfluenza, and sometimes coronavirus. I know that coronavirus, uh, which I actually put on the picture here, has gotten a very different uh, rap now. Um, in the past, we considered it relatively benign in dogs that it wasn't causing really serious problem. Now it's a very different story in humans. I'm not gonna get into that, but remember the distemper parvo are kind of the, the, the most common diseases. And I've seen them only in dogs that are nutritional deprived, uh, that are um, that are not very well looked after, um, they, that have parasites and their immune system is, is, uh, is challenged uh, and they're generally weaker. I used to work in Whistler, BC, where we had a lot of um, homeless dogs and shelter dogs. And, uh, you know, there were some areas that are really um, known for having these, uh, these problems because dogs just were not looked after very well. Uh, but generally, distemper and parvo are relatively rare. And also, as time progressed since the 80s, uh, when it was a real fatal disease and serious disease, it became weaker because, you know, some, for some reason, the virus, virus also has the goal, if I can say so, uh, to survive, right? Like the virus has to be passed on in, a, in, a, in order to survive. Therefore, it, it doesn't want to, in quotes, evolutionary. Uh, uh, destroy the host. Uh, so that's something that uh, you need to remember that over time viruses do get weaker. The conventional vaccine protocols are in my mind a little uh, obsolete um, because they suggest vaccination in six and eight weeks of the puppy's age and we know that the immune system does not mature sometimes until the age of 24 weeks, believe it or not. And most puppies have some sort of immune response at 12 weeks or 18 weeks, 20 weeks. So it does not really make sense to give the vaccine at six to eight weeks when we know that your puppy cannot make the antibodies, it cannot cook the dinner. And um, we also know that the the vaccine and the maternal antibodies will contract with each other in a negative way and it will leave actually your puppy less protected. And I've been always very perplexed by this adamant defense of early vaccination. 
And now there are even some other trends that are coming through that are even more frequent and even and done even earlier. And I'll talk about them in a moment. So remember that the immune system maturity does not happen until in most dogs, somewhere between eight to 24 weeks. But you know, I've seen often that it doesn't happen before 12 weeks of age. Now, as I said, you would not let, this is my little, my brother's uh, grandson, actually, my, my late brother, Martin, um, has a grandson and I'm kind of like his surrogate grandfather, even though I don't want to call myself that. But I definitely would not let him cook a dinner. I would not let him cook a meal. He's very cute, very sweet. He knows a lot of things, ride bicycle and, and he already skis and does all that. But, you know, I would not let him cook a meal. This is a statement that I know was written with a very good intention from one of the major organizations in the United States. I will not name because in the past I got in trouble when I started naming organizations because then they get on me. And it doesn't really matter. You can find it if you want the statement. But this organization that vaccinates a lot of dogs says, we vaccinate as frequently as possible every two to three weeks in what is essentially blindfolded race to catch the edge of the window at earliest time and youngest age possible. The edge of window meaning that they actually are saying, we are trying to basically catch the time when the antibodies, the maternal antibodies are not, no longer there and when the body can start making the antibodies, right? So what they, what they do actually now in many instances with, with young dogs, they start vaccinating them at four weeks and they actually suggest to vaccinate them every two to three weeks, on and on and on. It is no different as if we took a fly swatter and tried to you know, swat in the air to hope that we are gonna catch a fly, right? But the problem is that the vaccines actually are not, inert substance. They have a lot of pathogens that are modified. Many of them are alive modified and some of them are dead, but the immune system of the body and the body gets overwhelmed if it's given, you know, 30 to 40 different antigens or diseases within very short time. So I know that this is done with very good intention. I am not necessarily blaming. I'm not one of those people who are gonna be saying, you know, people who recommend vaccines are evil. No, no. I, I think that they, most of them have very good intention, but I'm trying to bring a little bit of a logic and sense in it. And remember that if we wage war against vaccines, it's not gonna be really any different. Like the, the other side in quotes, is gonna be going in opposition. We have to have a conversation discussion and actually agree on what is sensible and what makes sense. So every vaccines every two to three weeks until 16 weeks, we don't even know whether 16 weeks is enough because some dogs do not mature, do not have mature immunity and immune system until 24 weeks. So what if there's a dog that doesn't, it can't really produce antibodies at 16 weeks? and we leave them unprotected. And we don't vaccinate until one year of age or so. So that does not make a lot of sense from my point of view. And the other thing is that if a dog gets 30 to 40 antigens or from the immune system point of view diseases in three months, that is very unnatural. There is no mammal in nature that needs to go through 30 to 40 diseases in three months. You know what would happen to that mammal? It would be dead. Now, I know that these diseases or these antigens, these vaccines are changed and modified, but the immune system does not really know that. It still has to protect by creating antibodies. It still has to do everything that it needs to do. So if you ever felt like having a lot of work and being completely overwhelmed and either starting to freak out or go into depression, that's how the immune system sometimes may feel. And that's how immune disease uh, comes on, allergies um, or immune depression and suppression where uh, the body lets cancer happen very easily. Uh, 
those are signs of immune deficiencies or immune excesses. If you're tired, if you have too much work, you freak out or you go de into depression. The immune system has a tendency to do the same. Plus, if we give all these vaccines, there is another risk. And the risk is that the vaccine may, if the virus from the vaccine is live and gets passed on from dog to dog, just for, through natural um, interaction, it may eventually end up as a virulent virus again. The, see, the potential is relatively low, but it is there, which is another kind of crazy thing that we are not being told. But I have found the evidence of that in one of the statements in one of the research studies, and we'll post the links to these studies uh, in the comments and discussions. I've given it to Judy, who is in the background. Thank you, Judy, for passing these links on. Anyway, so um, you can see that there is a reversion to virulence. The title means that the virus that is um, that can cause disease can actually eventually turn into a virulent organism again, disease-causing factor. Uh, this was proven in distemper, distemper virus um, antigen. So, you know, over vaccination can be very, very serious. I, I, when I was downloading all my pictures from different libraries, I actually came across a few patients' pictures. I used to take pictures of my patients. Um, the overreaction of the immune system can result in the body attacking its own cells and skin and mucose membranes and all that. This is how it can look. This particular dog um, uh, you can see has, um, has erosions and eruptions on the skin. Some people would argue and say, how do you know that this is caused by vaccines? Well, sometimes I do know because the symptoms appear very much after the vaccination, or if I look at the vaccination protocol or the vaccination schedule of a particular patient, I can see that. And sometimes I do not know, but when I treat or treat with, uh, with uh, treatment or approach that neutralizes the side effects of vaccines, the side effect uh, disappears or the problem disappears. So that's another kind of reverse conf confirmation. I remember um, one of my patients, a little dachshund, uh, who was brought to me by her parents and she was about three years old and she stopped eating at the age of two years uh, when she was given booster vaccines. And uh, the, my clients were really distraught because their dog was fine, otherwise it wasn't eating. And uh, because the symptoms came up very soon after the vaccine, with a few weeks after the vaccine, I used a homeopathic treatment um, called Thuja, T-H-U-J-A, and the dog started eating within a few days after it was given. Now, I know that some people are not uh, for homeopathy. I'm not going to be convincing anyone, but I do know that it, ha it has had a really great um, impact on how I dealt with dogs that, that suffered from vaccine side effects. Um, I think everything in moderation, you know, if you have uh, some sort of evangelist uh, saying that homeop homeopathy is the only thing that they would use and they would never use Western medicine, well, um, just wait until they get really sick. They will end up in an emergency and they'll be very grateful for Western medicine and sometimes vice versa. Western medicine often doesn't address conventional um, or chronic disease and problems that uh, homeopathy and other holistic approaches do. And vaccines in a way are, uh, you know, they're necessary sometimes, but they're not always necessary. And if you think of the natural entryway of uh, vaccines to the, or pathogens in the body, it would be either through the mouth or the nose, in rabies through the skin, which is very rare exception. But most of the time, the virus would kind of prepare, it would knock at the door. It would knock, 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 here I am, get ready, right? Uh, the nasal mucosa and, and the mouth and the digestive tract would prepare and would be able to build defenses, you know, sometimes. And in the ideal situation, the body should not even show symptoms of disease. And we know that happens in some people who are positive for coronavirus and they have no symptoms. The virus entered the body, people created antibodies, and they have not had any symptoms. Maybe they felt a little tired one day. 
So this is the ideal. We have to actually make sure that the immunity is strong, but also in the natural setting, the pathogen would not enter through the skin, like when you give an injection. You know, I was trying to kind of find an image of what it means to give an injection of, of six, seven plus antigens or vac vaccines or disease pathogens. It really is as if you were sleeping in your bed and instead of someone knocking at the door, that person jumps through the window of your bedroom. So the body actually sometimes really freaks out, especially when there is more than one pathogen. Imagine if there is one person jumping in your bedroom and six people jumping in your bedroom when you're sleeping, a difference. Vaccines, as I said, are sometimes necessary, but they're not really natural and we should reduce their use as much as we can to maintain the immunity and keep your dog protected. Modified viruses may cause disease, as I said, in the rare cases. And I think that the current vaccine protocol do not make a lot of sense. I think that we've been rather foolish and irrational about vaccinating our puppies every two to three weeks or vaccinate them when they do not have a mature immune system. We've been expecting the three-year-old to cook the meal, to be honest, and that is not, in my mind, an ideal situation. Now, so what do we do? What do we do? <laughs> How do we keep our dogs protected? How do we make sure that, uh, that they're also not damaged by vaccines? As you know, I've had two dogs since I had my online kind of community and presence and have been with you. Um, Sky was handled exactly the same way as Pax. And I'm basically going to present to you what I do with, uh, with my pups. And what I also suggested, uh, used to suggest to my clients when I was in clinical practice. So um, what is the saner vaccination protocol? <laughs> well, the first thing that we need to do is to actually acknowledge the fact if we have a possibility to measure the antibodies of the mother, if they're, you know, some, some people breed dogs, some people rescue dogs. But if you do have a chance to actually measure the mother's antibodies before they get pregnant, that is one way to go. But many of us, or many of you, re rescue dogs. And I actually attempted to rescue a Border Collie puppy last year when I was looking for packs. I was, um, I was looking for rescue Border Collie. And um, I always had one in Oregon. And I called the, called the rescue organization. And I said, you know, I really would love to get your puppy. Is it possible that, you, would, you know, that I can get this puppy? I would fly back. I was visiting my mom. And they said, well, you know, let's go, let's take you through screening. So it took them uh, seven days to screen me. Uh, I sent them all the links and, and references from you guys. <laughs> and they still kind of said, well, you know, maybe. And then finally they decided that, yes, I, I can come and get the puppy. And then I said, well, I'm flying from, from the Czech Republic. I would like to get a guarantee that when I arrive that I'll get the puppy. And I said, absolutely no guarantees. So, uh, that's how I ended up with a puppy from a breeder because I was so disappointed and so brokenhearted and also feeling that sometimes the adoption systems and the rescue agencies love their power and they just power trip you left, right and center and basically sometimes lose a very good home. At least I'd like to believe that Pax is a good home. Anyway, so that's how I ended up with, um, with a non-rescue puppy. But those of you who actually rescue, you obviously cannot you have to skip this first step because you don't know who the mother was or if you do uh, it's too late to measure antibodies. So the next step is to ideally ensure that that the puppies had enough colostrum but again with rescue dogs you don't know that if you are a breeder or if you have a puppy from a breeder then they get enough colostrum and that's super important. Obviously making sure that the mother is healthy there's proper nutrition, that it is all the vitamins and minerals and omegas and probiotics and all that is super important. The next step in uh, the saner vaccine protocol is to make sure that you check for parasites. And I can't emphasize it enough because dogs that are infested with parasites are more likely to get sick with parvo and distemper and other diseases. This is something that is quite often forgotten. I actually suggest to take fecal sample from puppies 
um, at the age of eight weeks and 12 weeks and then monthly until about five months and then um, at one and two years of age and then yearly again, or maybe even twice a year, Pax and I go to warmer climate. So uh, that's something that we do twice a year. I do not like regular deworming. Again, if I can just check fecals, fecal sample, and there are now very reliable tests for not only for the presence of par parasites, but also some DNA detecting tests. Uh, so it's, it's actually quite accurate to see whether your dog has parasites or not. I do not like to deworm unnecessarily. So that's a difference um, between uh, my protocol and the more conventional protocol. But I do check regularly. And you bet that if, if your dog was positive for your puppy was positive for parasites, that you would see it at least in one of those tests. And I usually run a couple of different tests at the time to make sure that I reduce the chance of false negatives. Uh, probiotics. I do love probiotics, not only because they um, maintain and ensure perfect number two, they also ensure good, strong immune system and also immune system development. It is known that about 80% of the immune system of the body is located in the gut. And if you have a gut that is not healthy for whatever reason, then the immune system goes, uh, goes along and it's not very efficient. If you're not giving your puppies probiotics, I would highly recommend it. Then the most critical part for your puppy, kind of the most um, critical moment for immunity is between eight to 12 weeks because you still haven't measured the antibodies. You still don't know whether your dog is protected, still protected with, your, with the maternal antibodies or not. And so I've been using this kind of approach for now two decades, and I have not had one single puppy that would actually come down with a parvo or distemper or any infectious disease, you know, the, the ones that we can vaccinate against. I do not protect puppies from other dogs completely. I, I limit socialization to one or two dogs at the time. I would not take a young puppy to a dog park or somewhere where there's high density of dogs and urine and poo. But puppies would normally be challenged in nature from the adults, adults, not only on the behavioral level, but also on the infectious disease level. And while they're protected, you're actually basically doing what, <laughs> what those people uh, do when they give vaccine every two to three weeks, right? But they give six to seven antigens. And if you take your puppy out, and if your puppy's protected against the diseases, with maternal antibodies, you're basically taking it out and meeting other dogs, doing exactly the same thing that the vaccines do, but there are six or seven of them while your puppy in nature or in normal setting would be in touch with maybe one antigen or maybe two at the time. You know, I've seen so many maladjusted puppies as a result of them being sheltered from other dogs for four to five months. It's like if you, if you take a baby and, and do not let it interact with anyone until the age of uh, three years, right? Like it just does not really make sense. This is in my mind safe. It is not any more risky than giving the, the multivalent multiple vaccines. I think it's less risky, that's why I do it. So Pax and I, this actually, this picture is from Austria. We got him, <laughs> it was really funny. We were supposed to go to Austria without him. And then we realized that the breeder was um, made a mistake and he was eight weeks before we were going to Austria to see my colleague, uh, Dr. Furnches. So we picked up Pax and we went to Austria and we ended up in this beautiful village and we couldn't really, we had to go through back streets because carrying a puppy through a tourist village was crazy. But Pax enjoyed it. He had a really great time. And uh, he also met a few dogs on the way. The next step is to take um, antibody titer test. Titer is basically, think about it this way. <laughs> if antibodies colored, colored this water glass, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing screen. If, uh, if you put uh, cranberry juice in this water, water, um, water uh, and then um, you would put a lot of cranberry juice. It would take more water to actually stop seeing the color, the color uh, pink, right? Um, so basically the titer is a measurement of how much of the antibodies is in the serum, 
in the volume of serum, if, in the unit of ser serum. Uh, so again, if there's more antibodies, the water is too, more pink, more antibodies, more, more virus, more antibodies, not more virus, more antibodies, the, the water is more pink or concentrated. So um, <laughs> I got tangled in this a little bit, but remember that basically it's the amount of antibodies per volume of serum. Um, so the more or the more dilution you need to, you need to use to uh, not see any antibodies anymore, the higher the titer is, okay? So the thicker or the more colored the, 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 the serum is with antibodies in quotes, uh, the more we need to dilute it. So the dilution is actually the, uh, the determination or the method of dilution is the determination of antibody presence. Did I get tangled in this? Boy, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, so you can see that this is PAX. Uh, I took this test in August 1919. That was exactly 12 weeks after he, well, he was born on the 15th. So I was a few days late. But you can see that he had positive antibodies against distemper and parvo. So I thought, okay, great. Now we could socialize even a little more. No dog parks, no high density dog places, but we could still uh, take him out. So this is something that is quite different from what you will be told by most veterinarians. Uh, most veterinarians will tell you, do not socialize. But if you look at the natural settings and what dogs would do, they would not be living lives separately from, from other dogs. And especially when they're protected now, I go, okay, I'm really going to be making sure that he does see some dogs so he gets in touch with the pathogen while the antibody levels are kind of dropping and the immune system is maturing, right? We said that, uh, that the immune system matures somewhere between eight to 24 weeks. So we have, you know, we have plenty of uh, time and also the antibodies, the maternal antibodies can persist for uh, quite a few months as well. So we just have to trust that if we keep our dog healthy, well-nourished, uh, low stress, free of parasites, that this is actually the best way to go. And as I said, in my practice, I've done that for 20 years and I have not had any problems. I also know that some of you will be going, well, but you know, I'm really scared. Well, ultimately you will have to decide what to do about it, whether you vaccinate and go with your gut on that level or not vaccinate and go with your gut too. Um, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm only saying this is what I've done for two decades and it has worked really well. If antibodies are present, uh, I actually would to recheck the titer somewhere between five to six months because that's when the that's when the immune system matures for sure. And maybe six months would be better than, than um, I'm gonna change it here. Um, six months would be better than one uh, than five months because that's the 24 week mark. Just a second, 24 weeks, six times four, 24. <laughs> okay, there you go. And then again, another test uh, at one year. You may be asking, so what do you do about adult dogs? And I would say, wait a moment, because I'll show you uh, how long the antibodies in dogs last. So you don't need to vaccinate if antibodies are present, even without, um, even with our vaccines, Pax has never had distemper parvo vaccine. And he has maintained distemper parvo antibodies. Sky never had distemper parvo vaccines. And he has two maintained antibodies for a lifetime. It is kind of crazy, you guys, I know. But this is, you know, sometimes what I do, I really like to I really like to push the limit and, and use the logic and, and be a little more daring because if we are not daring, if we just follow the status quo without uh, really questioning, then we really don't uh, get to solid results and, and, and push the limit. The next uh, question is, how do we socialize? Well, you know, exactly like this, right? Like there's a dog on the street, you let them sniff, you let them say hi. Pax was actually initially really afraid of dogs barking behind fences. And so we had to teach him that those dogs are harmless. And uh, he's become a real social butterfly since then. He's very well adjusted. Uh, and, and part of it is it's not me and my training. It really is the, his opportunity to see other dogs in the crucial time of his evolution. And this is something that I really want you to take 
with you. Do not let your puppies be isolated, separated, socialize them and make sure that they're protected at the same time. Now, what to do when, uh, or how do you determine that antibodies are protective? You know, some vets say, well, your dog's antibodies are too low and you should be revaccinated. I go with the recommendation of any level antibodies being fine, because it is very obvious that the body has generated some sort of immune response. So it does have the, the memory of the virus. And if there was another insult by the virus, the body would very likely create antibodies one more time. It's almost like it has the recording, you know, you have your library and you have a library of distemper, you pull the book out and you learn how to cook the antibodies again or reread re it and, and make them, right? I know I sometimes use these funny associations, but I want you to remember that. And I know that if I was just kind of going with scientific lingo, it probably wouldn't be as easy, at least that's how I learned. Um, so what to do about boosters? Boosters should be given only if antibodies are not present. And I would then recheck the antibodies again in four weeks without giving a second vaccine. So the only time when you actually vaccinate your puppy at 12 weeks is when you also see no antibodies. But then you don't need to give boosters when you do a recheck in four weeks and you see that the titers are positive, they're good. Then you don't need to give another booster. And so this is something that is, uh, it, it's a real myth that boosters are necessary and needed. You know, there's many reasons why people believe in boosters. Some of some people just really think that it's important. Uh, some organizations just see it as a way of getting people in for rechecks or make more money. Just to kind of show you, this is a study that was done a long time ago, but you can still find it. The minimum duration of immunity for canine vaccines. This is the minimum duration of immunity for distemper. You can see that distemper is five, seven years. And uh, when your dog becomes five or seven years, like I've never seen one single dog with distemper pass one year. I haven't seen one single dog with parovirus pass one year of age, actually pass six months. So if you know that the antibodies last for years, why would we give vaccines yearly or even every three years, which is the regular recommendation now that is kind of endorsed. You can see that uh, kennel cough doesn't last very long. Leptospirosis uh, is kind of questionable about, um, about uh, antibody, how long they last, but it's not a very common disease. I've seen it once in 30 years of my practice. Lyme disease, about one year. And Giardia, well, well, we'll talk about all those vaccines too, because I do not recommend them and I'll tell you why later. So your goal should be, by the way, this is a picture that I, <laughs> I have to comment on this picture a little bit. So Panks and I spent uh, time in Prague uh, in September and October, visiting my family and my, my mom. We really enjoyed going around the streets and taking pictures. You know, I have 130,000 pictures in my library, so can I tell you? Anyway, I walked into this pet store and they were selling these, um, Alicia, how do you call them? Bow ties. The bow ties. Yes, yes. sorry. Bow ties. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <in a blank. laughs> anyway, bow ties. They were selling them for charity, for dog charity. So we bought, bought two and I put it on packs and took this picture. And he was such a good sport. He was fine with it. <laughs> anyway, so um, your goal should be to evaluate the disease incident in your area, especially in the non-core vaccines like le leptospirosis or Lyme disease or Giardia. But then these vaccines are not that benign, especially Lyme disease and Giardia vaccine and kennel cough vaccine, because they cause actually symptoms of the disease that they are supposed to prevent a little more than the distemper parvo. But even some other vaccines like distemper parvo can cause side effects and they can sometimes turn into more virulent strains. And this is something that is not really discussed. It is relatively rare, but it's possible. You should reduce the risk of side effects by minimizing vaccines and ensuring protection. Remember the egg here, 
I have the egg here again. If you overheat the egg, it's gonna be no good. If you freeze the egg, it's not gonna be any good. And with vaccines, it's the same thing. You have to just find the right balance. You can't overdo it either way. Because if you're totally negligent and your dog is full of parasites and you don't really care what the, the antibodies levels are and that at six months you take your dog to a dog park, it may happen that your dog will get parvovirus. Uh, it's relatively rare. And I would say that it's rarer than the side effects of vaccines that I've seen, but it's still possible. The other thing that you do need to remember that sick dogs, sick, sick animals should never be vaccinated. And you know, I hear stories, I'm gonna call them horror stories when a dog is, uh, is diagnosed with cancer and it's vaccinated at the same time. And it's not uncommon. So you must be well informed. You must know to say how to say no. This is one other situation that I, another patient that I saw several years back. Uh, Demodex is a parasite, it's a mange uh, that affects the follicle of, um, hair follicle of dogs. It's present in dogs that are immune suppressed. It often appears around the time of vaccination. And it also works very well or responds very well to homeopathic remedy that neutralizes the side effect of vaccine. So that's kind of interesting. You know, sometimes I kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together when I use this remedy for this condition and it improves, then I go, okay, this was related to the vaccine. So uh, this is a homeopathic remedy. If you suspect that, uh, that your dog has gotten ill after vaccination, it's kind of a, the first thing that I go to, not the only thing, the first thing that I go to when it comes to trying to neutralize the side effects. You will ask about rabies vaccine and Rabies vaccine should be given when it's legally required, regionally or for travel. And most countries require rabies for travel. I try to give it outside or separately from the other vaccines. Again, give less pathogens, less antigens at the same time. If you give one vaccine and then you don't have any legal requirements, from the government or for travel, then you can just measure antibody titer. Every two, three weeks, measure antibody titer, see whether your dog is fine. And if your dog is fine, that you know that he or she is very likely protected. But at the same time, I wanna emphasize that no, there's no vaccine manufacturer that will tell you that their vaccine is 100% protective either. So, you know, presence of antibodies suggests that your dog should be fine. And also you need to evaluate the risks of um, rabies and other diseases because that's super, super important to make sure that you don't vaccinate for disease that is absolutely uh, rare or not present in your area. Assess the risks, talk to your local officials, uh, see what the maps of uh, rabies incident or leptospirosis is. And uh, you know, I would like to mention, this is actually another image that I found this morning. I thought it's so funny. It's unrelated to rabies, uh, rabies but uh, it's kind of funny. The side effects of rabies vaccines that I've seen is actually sudden onset of fear and phobias. Uh, the phobias of water, which is also one of the symptoms of rabies. Or when I vaccinated a couple of dogs that were imported to New Zealand from Canada, uh, one of them was uh, suddenly started to show symptoms of being afraid of coming out of the house. And he was normal, socially adjusted dog and suddenly stopped wanting to go out of the house. We gave him a homeopathic remedy called Listen, which is actually to address the side effects of vaccines, a uh, rabies vaccine. And he became gradually, it wasn't sudden and all, uh, all at once, but gradually he became normal again. But this was an adult dog. This was not a puppy that was evolving, developing. This was a three or four year old dog and uh, started showing these unusual symptoms. So that's how we sometimes recognize the, the side effects of vaccination. Kennel cough vaccine, I talked about it. Um, 
It's caused by bacteria, uh, which is called Bordetella bronchi septica, and par influenza virus and coronavirus. Uh, coronavirus, this is not the same coronavirus that you see here. Nevertheless, chemical vaccine is not something that I recommend. I've seen it cause actually the actual disease itself, um, often. And uh, weirdly enough, I used to be told by the vaccine reps, it was just a coincidence that my patient got kennel cough right after the vaccine, that it probably got it before, and uh, it was just a coincidence. Well, after, after a while, I started to see these some symptoms and patterns appearing on a regular basis, and I discovered that uh, the vaccine actually does cause kennel cough itself. So if you have a kennel or a boarding facility or daycare that requires kennel cough vaccine, find someone else. Say that you will sign a waiver that will say that you will not hold them responsible and liable. Kennel cough is a self-limiting disease, very rare. It would be very rare that it would be serious. But you know, I have a suspicion that kennel cough vaccine is one of those vaccines that actually spreads the disease and becomes virulent again because it's live. So it's one of those weird situations here. I don't have a confirmation that for sure, but I have a suspicion and I'm allowed to suspect with freedom of free speech. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, preventing Lyme disease. Lyme disease vaccine is one of those that scared me the most in the course of my practice because I started seeing puppies that would be one to two years old coming down with severe joint abnormalities, spondylosis, inflammation, lameness, and all that. And this vaccine is, has never been approved in humans because it was not considered or has not been considered safe. And uh, it is still available. I believe it's still available for dogs. And if I'm wrong, and if it's not no longer available, forgive me, I didn't check. But I've seen these side effects on a regular basis. I would never give it to my dog. The best way to prevent uh, Lyme disease is to check your dog for ticks and also use tick hex, which I got a chance to use uh, for packs this fall in check because um, there were ticks um, in the grass. Uh, what tick has does, it actually, it is capable of uh, deterring the ticks, but if they attach, they die very quickly. And it is known that ticks have to be attached a lot and alive for 24 hours to transfer Lyme disease. So the best way is to check for ticks anyway, even if you use tick hex. Unfortunately, tick hex is not used in, uh, allowed in Canada because of the regulations. It is absolutely safe. We have not had any problems in more than five years years of using it uh, together with flea hex, but uh, regulations are regulations and um, you know who wants to sell more uh, conventional products. So uh, we are not allowed to sell this product in Canada. Anyway, um, so this is tick hex and it is a herbal um, spray that uh, we use for ticks. Now we have almost, we are almost done, you guys. We are almost done with um, this presentation. Leptospirosis, um, I did tell you that uh, it's good to check for incidence of the disease. So if you if we look at the map of uh, leptospirosis and I'll share the, the other link here again, clicking away. So this is a, an incidence of leptospirosis. You can see that, um, that the light areas are less likely infested. So Canada is a little better off than the United States, but definitely not in the hot zones of leptospirosis. You know, check with your local officials, your local vets, and see if leptospirosis is a problem. Uh, make sure that you first check the antibodies. Again, leptospirosis. Uh, do not vaccinate blindly because maybe, maybe, there, is, uh, maybe there are already antibodies. But also leptospirosis, there are several different kinds or types of leptospira. And uh, it is kind of difficult, even with vaccinations, to make sure that, that the right serovar or, or the right kind of leptospira is going to be um, uh, present in the vaccine. So it's a little tricky. I do not vaccinate against leptospirosis. You can see that some of the recommendations that I mentioned are based on the best intentions. It's based on the, the understanding of immunity. Some people believe that fly swatting and giving vaccines as often as possible is the right way to go. I'm actually concerned because vaccines contain not only pathogens and trust the immune system when there are too many pathogens or antigens or diseases in the vaccine. 
They also uh, contain aluminum and some of them contain mercury and it does uh, present an extra burden on the body, on the system. It's also true that there are some commercial interests uh, of vaccine companies. I will not get into this today because I think that telling you more is unnecessary, you can do the research. I think that we really need to become more empowered and better informed and less afraid. And I've been lucky, you know, it's much less scary for me to make a decision about vaccines than about my house plumbing. Uh, I've been lucky to have that background knowledge and am able to make decisions that I think are fair and solid and sound based on 20 years of, of, of them being used. But I'm also here for you to kind of pass this information on to you and, and to ask questions and make sure that, that you can make the most solid decision for your dog. I have two more. This is actually my dog, um, Sky, and the little doggy on the left is Brady. Brady is, uh, has just recently passed away. He was uh, Sky's friend. He was 16 and I think he was 16, 15 or 16. And we miss them both very much, but they taught us a lot about not only vaccine, but also health and how to keep raw, how to feed raw and, and um, how to steer away from toxic drugs and chemicals and processed food. I talked about the possibility of uh, the immune system getting overwhelmed by too many vaccines. There is one really useful study for you to see that uh, shows that there's a link between, or there might, might be a link between vaccination development of autoimmunity or autoimmune disease, meaning that the body starts attacking its own cells. I've seen that on a regular basis. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia is a disease where the red blood cells are attacked by the immune system and it's life-threatening. I've seen that develop more likely after vaccine vaccination, especially excessive vaccination of susceptible breeds. Some breeds are more susceptible than others. Golden Retrievers, Bernese Mountain Dogs, Labs, German Shepherds, um, they are much more uh, sensitive because they're also um, overbred more likely. Uh, yeah, it's hard to see. You know, I, I feel like I've, I've created this presentation and kind of vented the years of frustration with um, running into dog, well-meaning dog lovers saying that their dog is getting their third or fourth set of uh, puppy shots. And, uh, and I try to kind of guide them, but it's not always possible, right? So this is my way of uh, uh, reducing the, the stress and, and feeling like I'm doing at least something. This is a really cool statement that I found in another research study. It says many aspects of the canine immune system remain unknown, namely the characterization of the innate immune response and of the contribution of inflammation aging in the development of inflammatory autoimmune and neoplastic disease in elderly dogs. Furthermore, the effect of improving living conditions and regular vaccination on the activity of dogs immune system is unknown. So I personally feel that older dogs, middle-aged and older dogs should not be vaccinated unless it's required for travel. And in those cases, it's usually, it's usually just to rabies. But I have seen firsthand the dogs that get over-vaccinated, overwhelmed, and sick. Those who get cancer and get vaccinated again and plummet down, or those who have been those clients and dog lovers who always follow the advice and say, I've done everything I could and look at my dog, he's eight and he can't walk. He was diagnosed with cancer. He looks like he's 12 or 15. And I don't really know what happened here. Too much of anything is too much. And I would like you to embrace and I would like you to kind of remember, minimize the amount of vaccines. Make sure that you do not take chances, excessive chances, but ensure protection. So it's like with the egg, remember the egg, I have it in my pocket here. Too much of anything is too much, too much heat or too much cold. So try to stay in the middle, try to reduce 
the negative influences of vaccines and try to reduce the risks of your dog not having any antibodies. That's all. Thank you so much for listening. Alicia, thank you for moderating. Absolutely. <laughs> See you next time. And thank you, Judy, as well. <laughs>